Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Later in the show, State Auditor Josh Gallion is going to be joining me. We're going to talk a little bit about a an audit that came out that's caused a lot of controversy. Uh, the audit was of the North Dakota State College of Science. And what it said was is the folks at the NDSCS... Uh, well, they did a lot of things that the auditor ended up finding findings about. But one of the big ones is that uh, one of their vice presidents uh, was involved in negotiating a contract with a firm that his wife works for. A fact that was not, uh, although people at the university said was was I, I guess common knowledge, uh, was not officially disclosed. Also, that when the auditors tried to find information about that, the North Dakota State School of Science. Uh, obscured the information. It's a big deal because now the president of the university has been, well, insinuating that the state auditor lied. So uh, we'll hear from Josh Gallion about that coming up a little bit later in the show. But before we get there, have you ever seen a parking meter in the state of North Dakota? Well, if you have, it's illegal because uh, by state law, North Dakota doesn't have parking meters. Uh, going back to the 1940s, there was actually a uh, a gentleman, a farmer by the name of Howard Henry, who got fed up with the parking tickets he was getting in my hometown, the city of Minot, and so led a campaign to ban parking meters by state law. So since about the 1940s, 1950s, North the state of North Dakota has not had parking meters. Now... I don't think that's such a good thing. And the reason why is because parking is, well, it can be a scarce resource. We talk all the time about wanting denser developments in our communities. This is something that Governor Doug Burgum has talked about extensively. And frankly, I think he's right. The problem you have, if you if your communities begin to sprawl, right, if you're constantly doing development on the edges of your community, is you're pushing the boundaries of your communities out. The more square miles that your communities cover, the more area that you have to provide services to, garbage collection, uh, road maintenance, road plowing. I mean, j- just think of all, when it snows out, all those lane miles of road that have to be plowed. Police protection, fire protection, sewer, water. You know, it's it goes, the list goes on and on. The bigger our communities get, the more sprawling they are, the more that that costs us. And the thing is, is when it sprawls like that, the tax base doesn't necessarily keep up. So if we don't have a certain level of density in all this new development, right? There's, I mean, there's nothing at all wrong with our communities growing. Don't get me wrong. But if they're growing in a way where you don't have a dense population in those square miles that we're incorporating, then, well, it's somebody has to pay for all those services and it falls on fewer and fewer people. This is a real problem. And so people like Governor Burgum have said, hey, let's let's try to develop in areas where we already have services, right? Let's develop in areas where we already have sewer. We already have water. We already have police and fire protection. Let's do that instead. And so it's denser development. And in theory, well, that should drive property taxes down, right? Because there's more people in those areas. And so there's more property owners shouldering, more taxpayers shouldering, shouldering the expense of all that development. Well, a key to that is parking, right? Because one one drawback to, you know, developing your business downtown or maybe living downtown or what have you is is parking and to my mind that's where parking meters come in. Parking meters can implement what what's called congestion pricing, which is to say that when because parking parking can be a limited resource in some of these areas, you know, new parking meters can do something along the lines of, uh, you know, when there's higher demand for parking, raise rates. And so what that does is that deters people. If you really want to park there, well, you can pay the rate and park there, but not necessarily. It, essentially what it does is it, it leaves enough. It, it ensures that there's more parking for everybody. Now, some people may end up paying more. Some people may end up paying less because at other times when there's not a lot of demand for parking, you can actually lower the prices. You can even make the parking free. That's the reality of modern parking meters. They're not like they were back in the 1940s when the state of North Dakota banned them. It's different now. And in some ways, I think it's necessary now. A lot of our communities in North Dakota are becoming very densely developed. Places like Fargo, Grand Forks, Bismarck, even Minot, Williston. Watford City, Dickinson. I mean, these are all communities that have been growing. These are all places that could potentially benefit from parking meters. And then the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals just 
threw a little curveball into this debate, right? Because Governor Burgum came into office and he said, hey, let's bring back parking meters. And during the 2017 legislative session, the first session of his his term in office, uh, State Senator Jessica Unruh, a Republican from Beulah, introduced legislation to end the ban on parking meters and would have allowed uh, local entities to uh, to come in and, and put the parking meters in place. Uh, that bill was defeated. Which brings me back to the Sixth Circuit again. Uh, there was just a case out of Michigan. And again, and, and by the way, I, I started out this segment talking about a cranky farmer who didn't want to didn't like parking tickets. Uh, the Sixth Circuit case <laughs> deals with a, a cranky woman in Saginaw, Michigan, who also didn't like paying for her parking tickets. And I want to be clear. I love cranky people who get upset about this sort of thing and challenge the government because I think. Well, I, I think that's a responsibility of citizenship. If you do, if the government's doing something you feel is wrong, I think you have a duty as a citizen to push back on it. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't want to. When I'm saying a cranky farmer, I like cranky people. I like people who get cranky about this stuff and challenge it. I, I think that's a good thing, even if the outcome, you know, banning uh, in North Dakota here, banning uh, uh, parking meters, wasn't necessarily what we wanted. Anyway, ba- I, I keep digressing. Back to the Sixth Circuit. So what the Sixth Circuit did, what what the Saginaw case had to do with, was a woman who said that she felt that when parking enforcement folks were putting chalk on her tires, that this was violating her Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable search and seizure. Now, I the, the chalking thing, uh, if you've ever watched parking enforcement happen, it's, it's a tactic. What law enforcement does is they come along and they'll put a little chalk mark on your tire so that they can measure the last time you, uh, you, you left, right? So, you know, basically they put a chalk mark on your tire and then they can tell if you've moved your car or not. If you move your car, then the chalk mark disappears. And if you park it there again, well, then then they know. So that's uh, that's what they do. That's how they do parking enforcement, except the, the Sixth Circuit came in. And what the Sixth Circuit said is, no, that's that's an unwarranted search. What they said is that there's a previous precedent in in, in the federal courts. And what the previous, it's called the Jones precedent. And what it is is it's law enforcement attached a GPS unit to a car and then use that GPS unit to track data on where that car went. And the Supreme Court ruled, no, that is a unwarranted search. Law enforcement can't just slap a GPS unit under your bumper or something and track where you go. That's a search. And the reason for that is they made physical contact with your your property. It's not law enforcement like surveilling you, right, following you around. It's not law enforcement using traffic cameras or what have you to track where you're going. It was law enforcement making physical contact with your property. That physical contact in the eyes of the courts is the problem, at least a problem when law enforcement doesn't have a warrant. If they're saying basically if you make physical contact with somebody's property, that meets the common law definition of trespass. And if law enforcement is trespassing for the purposes of collecting and storing information, which obviously the chalk mark is about collecting information about when you last drove your car or moved your car, uh, well, they're saying, at least in the eyes of the court, well, that needs a warrant. I'll leave it up to you to decide. That seems maybe a little bit of a stretch to me, but... The Sixth Circuit has ruled that way. That is now controlling precedent in the Sixth Circuit. It may very well be recognized in other jurisdictions, including North Dakota's. It may even be upheld by the Supreme Court. I don't know. My point is, is that parking enforcement may be about to get a lot more, a lot more complicated. And what might make it easier is if we had parking meters. And not only would parking meters alleviate some of these issues with parking enforcement, right? Because if you have a parking meter in place, it's pretty easy to enforce the parking code. You can just write a ticket when the meter's expired. No need to even touch the person's vehicle. So, but but also if we had parking meters, it would contribute to all the things I just mentioned about congestion pricing and making parking more available in the denser areas of our communities. And of course, denser development could contribute to cheaper government services because they're serving a smaller area this just seems like a win-win-win now a lot i know a lot of people out there saying well why should i have to pay for parking why should i have to pay for parking on these streets the thing is is you're already paying for them if we had parking meters perhaps that revenue could be used to offset some of the costs we're paying to provide services in these areas repairing potholes etc etc now i realize maybe that's a little bit of a pipe dream when has government ever instituted a new tax a new revenue stream and then reduced another one it doesn't happen very often but maybe we could demand that maybe that's what the legislature could do we would uh 
allow parking meters and in exchange we would lower another tax I, I think that would be a move in the right direction anyway at the very least parking meters should be a tool in our toolbox my interview with state auditor josh galleon up next this episode of the plain talk podcast is brought to you by energy of north dakota Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. State Auditor Josh Gallion joins me. He His office recently com- uh, completed an audit of the North Dakota State School of Sciences, and the findings made some headlines. Uh, among them, uh, there were a number of findings, but I, I think the top-level findings was that a, a vice president at the school, uh, a gentleman who uh, by the name of Tony Grinberg, who was also a, a longtime state senator from Fargo, currently a member of the Fargo City Commission, uh, the, the auditor's office said that he was involved in negotiations to uh, w- with, with a, a company called the Flint Group, which got a contract from the North Dakota State School of Sciences uh, to develop uh, like a strategic plan. And Mr. Grinberg's wife works for that company. Uh, he claimed that, uh, you know, he wasn't involved in it. He didn't disclose that relationship officially, although the president of NDSCS, Dr. John Richmond, you know, claims everybody knows about it. But, but officially, as a matter of the paperwork, didn't disclose his association with that company. And then uh, also, it, it, according to your office, Josh, when you came looking for emails to flesh out what the nature of this relationship was and how those negotiations went, you say the school was reticent, I, I guess, in, in turning over information. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Explain to us what's going on with this. Wow, you did an uh, excellent job in, in summarizing that. I don't know why you uh, really have me on here, but uh, well done. Um, yes, we we uh, we went in there and, and looked into a couple of different areas. We had three objectives on this audit. Uh, the one of them was to make sure that spending for the Career and Workforce Academy was uh, authorized and appropriate. And that's the section here um, that begins on page four of the report that kind of goes through uh, what we uncovered. And yes, we uh, we did make some information or some correspondence requests uh, to the uh, university, and what they informed us, and 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 we include all of these emails in the report, so you don't have to take my word for it. You can read them all um, right in the in the appendix of the report. And I want to say on page B11, uh, it summarizes essentially a a phone conversation that took place after several requests for information. And we were essentially told that uh, that there were no correspondence, that this entire contract was done uh, over the phone directly by Dr. Richmond. Uh, However, when we contacted the North Dakota University system uh, and made the information or the email request, uh, we, we identified the individuals that we were uh, looking for the emails, the to and from, and a few key words. And that, uh, that turned up hundreds of emails. Uh, and, and what we've provided in some of the report is uh, essentially the emails that, that show a different uh, set of facts than what the university initially provided to us. Now, I, Dr. Richmond disputes this. There was a recent he he the, he and um, Mr. Grinberg held a recent uh, I guess a forum on campus, and it was covered by the Wapaton Daily News. And I'm going to quote you a little bit from their article. They wrote, "I quote Richmond reiterated that that his excuse me Richmond reiterated his disagreement that NDSCS or Dakota State School of Science engaged in any misleading or cover up." During the state audit, the auditor's office submitted what Richmond called a very subjective request. Now, this is quoting Dr. Richmond. An IT person or even myself can be challenged trying to come up with exactly what they were looking for with the requests they provided to us. During the course of the audit, Richmond added, a more specific request was submitted to the North Dakota University Systems Information Technology staff. The NDUS employees were given precise terms for their search. He continued. Now, this is again quoting Dr. Richmond. You ask two different questions and you get two different results. When that happened, he, 
referring to to yourself, Auditor Galleon, uh, concludes that we obstructed and misled them. That's what frustrates me the most in this process today. So I, I guess the, the way he's saying it is you guys asked him some vague questions. They weren't sure how to answer it. You asked the, the North Dakota University System Office more specific questions, and you got your answers. And he's saying that's not them obstructing. Your response to that? Well, I think it's, uh, it, from our point of view, uh, to us, it's very clear. In fact, if you look at page B7 of the audit report, the very top, uh, you can see that it says, please provide. We made it, this is an email request that we made to the system off or the university. Um, it said, please provide all correspondence related to the selection of Flint Group as a consultant on the Workforce Career Academy initiative. And their response in red goes back to uh, a previous email that says that they, you know, they followed policy. Uh, and then they later on say that they don't have any emails. So yeah. we went, uh, which which we thought was odd because we made another request uh, previously. There was another uh, potential consultant that they were working with, and we made a similar request to for those that information. They did provide emails. Now your your report, which by the way I I posted it at sayanythingblog.com. I'm sure you could find it on on the state auditor's website as well. Um, your report lays all this out. I mean, you lay out a timeline. The timeline is tied to specific emails. Um, I don't know that any of that's in dispute. And, and I will tell you, I mean, I, I I have filed a lot of open records requests for various, including the North Dakota State School of Science, but but a lot of different institutions in the university system. And I always start my request. And I've granted, I'm a member of the public. I'm not the state auditor asking, but I always start my request very broad. And typically what they do is they'll come back and they'll say, well, your request turned out this many thousands of emails. Do you want to narrow, do you want them all or do you want to narrow it down? And, and we work from there so that I can, you know, sort of hone in on what specifically I want. What you're telling me, I mean, Dr. Richmond says, well, their initial request was too vague, but they came back at one point and said, well, there's no emails. That's an absolute statement. Not, not, there's too many emails. Can we winnow this down? You know, you're, you know, what specifically do you want? They said there's no emails matching that request. That to me is problematic. I mean, that to me is, is, it doesn't seem truthful, Josh. And that is why we included all of this in the report so that the readers can see uh, for themselves. Again, you look at page B11, the second bullet. Uh, this happened, you know, it took several months between our initial request, as you can see in that timeline, to the email on, on page B11. And the second bullet uh, is from that conversation that the audit manager made directly to, the I believe, the business manager. It says, there was no email correspondence regarding a proposal of procurement services for the Workforce Career Academy between NDSES and Flint Group. And as you can see, Mr. Grinberg and Dr. Richmond are both included on the email uh, to and from. I mean, you would think at that point, I mean, Mr. Grimmett shouldn't know that, that he was involved and he was emailed. Now, I read elsewhere where Dr. Richmond has has said that, um, you know, Mr. Grimberg was just acting as a go-between, that he wasn't involved. He was just a uh, he was just a messenger. I, I think it's how Dr. Richmond described it, you know, the saying basically, you know, Mr. Grimberg's involvement was not problematic. But your office made a finding that said, no, uh, he shouldn't have been involved at all. Is, I mean, is that correct? Can you explain? Because Dr. Rich was kind of trying to explain that away, saying, well, he wasn't really involved. He was just a messenger. I made the decision. Well, by, uh, to us, when we look at uh, all of it, by failing to disclose the conflict of interest, uh, there are some specific rules that, yes, he should have not been involved because of the direct relationship that uh, uh, of his wife being the chief financial officer. And I believe we provide some of those email correspondence uh, as well from uh, uh, Mr. Greenberg to Flint Group. Now, do you? Uh, the, the other thing that Dr. Richmond says is he says that that Greenberg's that the fact that his wife worked for the Flint Group was well known; everybody knew it. So, therefore, disclosing it was just a formality. You know, it was just, in, in the, uh, you know, both Grinberg and Richmond are going back. So, you know, should we have done it in retrospect? Yes, but it was just a formality. Everybody knew it's no big deal. That's that's sort of their defense for that. For that. Well, to us, the policy states that, uh, as we read it, that, that needs to be disclosed. Uh, we may not have necessarily known it until we saw some of the emails. 
So to us, when we look at it, that disclosure is is more than just for internal knowledge. In, in in the sake of transparency, we need to be very clear with the public, especially when public funds are involved. Uh, all of these types of relationships, so that that nobody has the perception that uh, there's any wrongdoing. And so that 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 uh, disclosure of the conflict of interest would have been beneficial po- uh, possibly to us from the beginning. No, again, going back to this Wapaton Daily News article, um, their lead in the article is a quote from somebody who asked a question at the forum. The question was, are you, in fact, telling us the state auditor is lying to us? You can't both be correct. Uh, later on, uh, Mr. Dr. Richmond, you know, essentially says that, um, you know, you, you, you can't um, I'm trying to find his quote here. Uh, oh, he, uh, he, he responds to me. He goes, I'll let you determine if Galleon is lying, okay? You read the auditor's report and you read my response. So, I mean, there's, I, I think there's a lot of people in the public who are saying, well, the auditor's office is telling us one thing. Uh, the leadership at the North Dakota State School of Science is telling us another thing. Both of these things can't be true. And Dr. Richmond almost kind of seems to be suggesting that, that your office isn't telling the truth. How do you respond to that? Well, that's why we disclose all of this, uh, these emails and this correspondence in the report. We, we direct people to the report. You can see the actual correspondence. You can see the, the documentation back and forth. You can see that what the campus uh, had told us over the phone, and people can make that determination for themselves. But again, we believe that we have conducted a thorough uh, audit, and we have made our uh, findings public. Uh, if you, um, the, the other, the other question obviously was was the, the question of the, of the Flint Group and and, and Mr. Grinberg's uh, relationship to that organization, and then also you know whether or not it was disclosed and whether or not anything was was withheld. Uh, another finding that that you folks found was that the school had been spending money on pursuing uh, and, and a lot of this has to do with the career academy um the north Dakota state school of sciences wants to and they have a they have already a campus presence at fargo they want to expand that presence essentially it, it's it's a whole it's a whole issue that's been going on for a while your office found that, that there were some funds that were perhaps spent inappropriately there can, can you illuminate that for me so the the contract, the funds that paid for this contract and the strategic plan were taking, taken from uh, SEEK funding, uh, Southeast Education uh, Cooperative, I believe. What they do is they contract with the State School of Science to provide an executive director. And what happened over the years is that fund, they have paid in excess for the administrative services provided, and they built up approximately $60,000. The, the College then used those funds to pay for this Career Workforce Academy strategic plan. And when we look at that, when we looked at the contracts, the funding that SEEK provided was very uh, explicit for the executive director's salary and benefits and and operating costs or or travel expenditures for that position. We believe that, that NDSCS should probably notify SEEK of the excess funds because these funds are paid by K through 12 public schools. Yeah. And well, so and so diverting that funding to the Career Workforce Academy which beyond that we questioned the uh, uh, authority and the approval process of them uh, moving forward with this uh, but we feel that we they should notify seek of those uh, funds. Well it's, I I mean I, I think it's well known that's that's been something of a pet project of Dr. Richmond's for some time now you know it's been sort of a driving force but your job and I I think a lot of people sometimes get confused about what the auditor's job is in in this regard um your job is the state laws are what they are uh policies for the North Dakota University system are what they are other people develop these policies your office isn't involved in, in that at all other people make the rules you go through and you say well these are the rules are these folks following the rules? And and you flag them. And then from here on out, your office is done with this matter, right? I mean, you're obviously you, you have a role in explaining the report and explaining your findings and, and explaining why you found what you found and, and, and defending that. But beyond that, your role's done in this. This now goes to the university system leadership. This role now goes to our other state policymakers like lawmakers to make decisions about your findings. Is that correct? Yes, 
Because I think a lot of people misunderstand would, what your role is. That would be correct. We, we identify uh, potential discrepancies. We report those discrepancies to the governance. Uh, and, and then it is up to them to take corrective action. Now, for performance audits, we typically will do a, a follow-up uh, down the road. We'll, we'll come back and make sure uh, that these findings, uh, that they've taken some action, and then we will report on, on those actions. But no, we do not have any part in the uh, changes or the improvements that happen there. That is how we maintain our independence, and that is essential for us to be uh, uh, the auditors that we are is, is ensuring that independence from, from management. Is this typical, this audit? Because I'll tell you, I've, I've read a lot of audit report, both now under your, your tenure and, and your predecessor's tenure. I've, I've read a lot of audits. This, this seems like a pretty rare situation where the auditor is, you know, basically saying, listen, we were misled or, or there was information that, that wasn't disclosed here. That seems pretty unusual. Is that, is that your feeling as well? Uh, it, it was when, when this first came up and I asked, uh, we have a couple of staff that have been here for, um, you know, nearly three decades. And I asked them, had, has the auditor's office ever made, made a recommendation like this? And from their understanding, this may be a first for the auditor's office where we have, uh, we have been told there's no documentation yet. When we made a, a separate request, we found a lot of correspondence. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you, it's not a first for me. Uh, I've run into it a couple times, but it, it is rare. I mean, it, typically our state government is, is actually very good. I mean, even even when I'm filing requests and everybody knows what I'm gunning for and they know I'm going to be critical, typically I find, as, as again, I'm, I'm just a member of the public, but I find they're helpful and I get the information I'm looking for. Uh, maybe sometimes not as quickly <laughs> as I'd like, but that might be due to my own uh, impatience than, <laughs> than other things. But uh, generally, it's good. So I, I think this is unusual. It, it was disappointing to see, you know, whatever the audit findings are, we would hope uh, our state officials would be uh, transparent and, and, and accountable and, and responsive. And I'm I'm not sure we uh, we met that aspiration in this situation. Josh, anything else on this? No, uh, I would just say, yeah, I would encourage people to go read the report. It's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I would say objective one is unusual for us, as you've noticed. Uh, objective two and three, that part of the report is is typically what we look for in a performance audit, where we can identify areas where they can improve uh, the reporting, uh, the data, verifying that they've got uh, accurate uh, information that they're putting out there to the public. So, again, it's uh, I, I think the audit team did a, a fantastic job. Uh, they were very thorough, and I would just encourage people to, uh, to to read through it. Josh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Today's Plain Talk podcast is, well, it's all over, which you probably knew listening to that sad music that ends every podcast. Uh, remember, new episodes come out Monday through Friday right away in the morning. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, it's available, should be available on pretty much every platform out there, including a new one I just found. It's called Swoot. Seems like a silly name for a podcast app, but let's face it. A lot of these apps have silly names. I guess it's something there's like a social aspect of it. Once you get on there, you can see what podcasts your friends are listening to. I don't know. Uh, anyway, Plain Talk's available on there. If that sounds like it's sort of your sort of thing, hey, maybe try that app out. Otherwise... We're on Spotify, we're on uh, Stitcher, we're on Apple Podcasts, of course, uh, we're everywhere. If you find a place where the podcast is not available, please let me know, rob at sayanythingblog.com. If you have any problems listening to the show at all, if you want to send me feedback on the show, if you want to send in questions for our weekly guest, Senator Kevin Kramer and Congressman Kelly Armstrong, you can certainly use rob at sayanythingblog.com for that as well. Senator Kramer wasn't on last week, he's not going to be on this week, he'll be back to his regular schedule next week. Congressman Armstrong is on again this week follow me on social media i'm at rob port on twitter you can search uh, just search for rob port on facebook you'll find me say anything blog has a, a facebook account and a twitter account as well check those out and thanks for listening wouldn't be possible without you we'll talk again